This presentation describes the condition of diverticular disease, in particular how it arises and how it is treated. Diverticular disease, otherwise known as diverticulosis, affects the colon. It does not affect the rectum. It tends to affect the part of the colon called the sigmoid colon, which is the last part of the colon just before it joins the rectum. And there is an abrupt cutoff because, as previously, previously stated, the, the rectum is not affected. It is characterized by numerous pockets or outpouchings of the wall of the colon. These pouches vary enormously in, in number and in size, but are typically a few millimeters in diameter. They represent herniation of the mucosa and submucosa, that is the lining of the bowel through a point of potential weakness in the muscle of the bowel wall, and uh, that is where the blood vessels traverse the muscle. This is a diagrammatic representation of the affected part of the bowel. As you can see, it largely affects the sigmoid colon, which is the part of the colon that lies on the left-hand side of the abdomen, quite low down, just above the rectum. And this is an image taken at colonoscopy of the inside or lumen of the colon, showing numerous diverticuli, which is the plural of diverticular. It is important to note that the surrounding colon itself is healthy and there is no evidence of inflammation which would otherwise be called diverticulitis. Diverticular disease is a common condition with a significant proportion of the population suffering from it. The majority of patients however don't actually realize they have the disease and it tends to be picked up at colonoscopy when investigating symptoms of other conditions such as bowel cancer. It affects roughly the same number of men and women and the incidence tends to increase with age as does the number of pockets. However, it can affect some indiv individuals in their 20s. The cause of diverticular disease has not been identified but it tends to be more common in, in individuals who have a diet that is relatively low in fiber. It is thought that the pockets develop due to high pressures developing within the lumen of the colon itself causing a balloon effect and there is often an associated thickening of the muscle otherwise known as hypertrophy in the affected segment of the colon. Whether this is a cause or an effect is still unknown. As previously mentioned the whole colon can be affected but there is a propensity for the sigmoid colon to be affected and to a lesser extent the descending colon which is just upstream of the sigmoid colon Similarly, the cecum and ascending colon can be affected. This is the part of the colon on the right-hand side of the body. As previously discussed, it does not affect the rectum. As far as symptoms are concerned, the majority of patients do not have any symptoms from their diverticular disease and is often diagnosed incidentally at colonoscopy or on CT scan. The patients that do experience problems tend to have minimal symptoms and these include an intermittent vague abdominal discomfort, particularly in the left iliac fossa, and this is the part of the abdomen low down on the left hand side, and it is thought that this is due to spasm of the muscle within the bowel wall. They can also, also experience some bloating and a variable bowel habit. When you examine the patient there is usually little to find, although in the thin patient it is possible to feel the thickened segment of the sigmoid colon. The diagnosis of diverticular disease is made at colonoscopy and it is important at this point to exclude coexistent conditions such as bowel cancer. Whilst cancer may coexist with the diverticular disease, there is no increased incidence of cancer in patients who have diverticulosis. When diverticular disease is diagnosed initially on CT scan, it is, wise, it is a wise precaution to perform a follow-up colonoscopy to exclude other conditions such as cancer. Because most patients don't have any real problems from their diverticular disease, the management largely involves reassurance and advice about maintaining an adequate intake of fiber. There is some theoretical concern about avoiding foods containing pips and seeds, such as tomatoes, but there is very little practical evidence to support this. Similarly, there is no evidence to suggest that eating these types of food increase the risk of diverticulitis, which is inflammation associated with diverticular disease. As previously mentioned, the pockets can become infected and the inflammation associated with this is called diverticulitis. 
purely by a process of numbers, it is more likely in patients who have significant disease, that is, an extensive number of pockets. The typical symptoms are pain, and there is often a constitutional upset in the form of fever and feeling generally unwell. Patients also tend to experience a change in their bowel habit. The treatment of diverticulitis is prompt administration of antibiotics, either from the GP or when a patient goes through the emergency room. They may require admission to hospital for intravenous antibiotics and pain relief if the attack is severe. However, most cases settle with this treatment, but it can take several days. Once the infection has resolved, the diverticular disease, of course, remains and the attack may be a one-off or there may be recurrent attacks. It is simply impossible to predict whether the patient will suffer attacks in the future and really the only thing that can be done to prevent them is to maintain an adequate intake of dietary fibre. Even this, however, gives no guarantee against future attacks. In an unlucky few, the diverticulitis will not settle with antibiotics or the patient may suffer one of the severe sequelae, namely abscess formation or perforation leading to peritonitis. Under these circumstances, emergency surgery is indicated and involves a Hartman's procedure, which is, which is a resection of the affected part of the colon and the formation of a temporary colostomy. This situation can be life-threatening, particularly in the elderly, who tend to have significant comorbidity, such as heart disease or chest disease. Once the patient has recovered from this episode, which can take several weeks, a reversal of the Hartman's can be undertaken where the colostomy is taken down and the bowel joined up again. This requires a second major procedure. In the event that emergency surgery can be avoided, the decision has to be made as to whether to treat the diverticular diverticular disease conservatively or whether to proceed to an elective resection. The decision is very much based upon how often the attacks are happening and whether there is a perceived risk of developing one of the major sequelae such as perforation. If it is done in the cold light of day then it is usually possible to perform the surgery laparoscopically otherwise known as keyhole surgery and the operation involves a resection of the affected part of the, part of the colon together with a primary anastomosis or join-up. It is sometimes necessary to perform a temporary covering ileostomy upstream of the join and this is a decision usually made at the time of surgery and is done to protect the join whilst it heals. The ileostomy is then closed as a minor procedure at a later date. Whilst the operation removes the part of the colon that is badly affected, it does not prevent further formation uh, of diverticulae in the remaining colon, although this is unusual.